Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to continue on with uh, some joints of the upper extremity, and we're going to talk about the acromioclavicular joint or the AC joint. The previous video, we discussed the sternoclavicular joint. And this was a joint between the manubrium of the sternum and the sternal end of the clavicle. So this video, we're shifting distally or laterally along the clavicle, and we're going to be looking at this joint right here, between the acromial end of the clavicle and the acromial process or acromion of the scapula. This joint right here is going to be the AC joint or the acromioclavicular joint, and I'll probably just call it the AC joint from here on out. It's obviously easier to say, and you'll often hear AC joint and when you're talking about this kind of stuff. So the AC joint is not a ball and socket joint like we saw for the sternoclavicular joint. This was a functional ball and socket joint um, transformed into one via that articulated disc. The acromioclavicular joint is still a synovial joint, but it's a plain synovial joint. So it's only going to allow gliding type of movements. Okay? And as we mentioned, it's here in green. It's a joint or an articulation between the acromial end of the clavicle right here and the acromion or acromial process of the scapula. Okay? Over here on the proximal end or the medial end of the clavicle, this is actually the sternal end of the clavicle, which would articulate with the manubrium of the sternum. Okay? And again, here is another way to put it. It's a junction of the lateral end of the clavicle or distal end to the acromion process of the scapula. So that joint capsule right there is highlighted in green. Now a few other things here before we get into all the details, let's actually think about what we're looking at. So here's the scapula, okay? We don't see a spine right here of the scapula, so this must be the anterior surface of the scapula, okay? This is actually the subscapular fossa. Subscapularis muscle would actually be sitting in here, okay? Right here, this structure is the coracoid process of the scapula. If you remember, the coracoid process is the more anterior of the two structures when we compare it to the acromial process or acromion. The acromion is more posterior. The coracoid process is more anterior. So this looks like it's a little bit more forward. That's another way we can tell that this is an anterior view. Right here beneath the coracoid process, this is actually the neck of the scapula, and we obviously can't see it, but this would actually be the glenoid fossa or the glenoid cavity that articulates with the head of the humerus. So really right here, this is the glenohumeral joint, and this uh, fibrous tissue right here is of course the glenohumeral joint capsule or the shoulder joint capsule. Okay? Again, we're going to talk about that in even more detail in a future video. Right here, this is the transverse humeral ligament. We're again going to see that much later. But this is a ligament that actually spans between the greater tubercle of the humerus and the lesser tubercle. And it pretty much goes right over this intertubercular groove. And we're going to see later on that the tendon of long head of biceps brachii actually goes underneath this transverse humeral ligament. And then it'll curve around and attach on the superior aspect of the glenoid fossa. Okay. But this transverse humeral ligament provides a sheath for the tendon of the long head of the biceps. And again, if we follow this down uh, from the transverse humeral ligament, this is the intertubercular groove. Okay. Here's the greater tubercle right here. If we follow the greater tubercle down, we're going to see that this crest right here. This is really just the lateral lip of the intertubercular groove. Here's the lesser tubercle. If we follow that down, again, there's a crest right here. That's really just the medial lip of the intertubercular groove. And if you think back to some of the previous videos, or if you've watched them, um, depending on the order, remember that the lateral lip of the IT groove is really just the insertion of pectoralis major, and then the medial lip is the insertion of latissimus dorsi and teres major. Okay? And then biceps brachii long head, most of the tendon, actually sits in the groove. Okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Now we can see some other ligaments up here. So let's actually go to a zoomed in uh, version of this and we'll actually dissect that further. So again, here's the AC joint in green. So a junction between the uh, distal end of the clavicle or lateral end, acromial end, to the acromial process of the scapula. Now, uh, right here, we have this notch. This is called the suprascapular notch. It's a notch between the superior border right here and the coracoid process. Notice there's a ligament that goes over that notch. This is called the superior lateral scapular ligament. 
okay? And it essentially transforms this notch into a foramen. So when you have this superior lateral scapular ligament, it turns the suprascapular notch into a hole called the suprascapular foramen. It turns out, though, that the suprascapular nerve actually goes through this foramen posteriorly to uh, innervate the infraspinatus muscle. Okay? So this is the suprascapular foramen created in the suprascapular notch by this ligament called the superior lateral scapular ligament. Now that really doesn't have anything to do with the AC joint, I just wanted to go over that. Now for the ligaments of the AC joint. We have several ligaments stabilizing it, and they're listed right here. The first one is called the acromioclavicular ligament. The acromioclavicular ligament is really just a thickening, again, of the joint capsule, okay, uh, right here that goes between the acromial process and the acromial under the clavicle. So it would actually be here nestled in the joint capsule, acromioclavicular ligament, right? It actually superiorly strengthens the joint capsule, okay? Then we've got two ligaments right here. There's a conoid ligament and a trapezoid ligament. The conoid ligament's called conoid because if you look, it kind of loops around here like a cone shape, so to speak. And it actually attaches the coracoid process of the scapula to the conoid tubercle of the clavicle. So the clavicle has a little bump called the conoid tubercle, and that's a site for the attachment of the conoid ligament. So this is the conoid ligament, and this one right here that's a thicker, or wider I should say, on the clavicle, and narrower on the coracoid process, this is called the trapezoid ligament. Okay? The trapezoid ligament and the conoid ligament collectively are part of the same ligament for whatever reason, and that's called the coracoclavicular ligament. Okay? Why is it called coracoclavicular? Because it connects the coracoid process to the clavicle. Okay? These three ligaments right here are what stabilize the acromioclavicular joint. The acromioclavicular ligament stabilizes the joint superiorly. The coracoclavicular ligament, which is comprised again of conoid and trapezoid ligaments right here, that's going to stabilize the lateral end of the clavicle in the acromioclavicular joint. Okay? So hopefully that makes sense. There's also another ligament here which doesn't stabilize the acromioclavicular joint. That's called the coracoacromial ligament. Why doesn't this stabilize the AC joint? Well, because it doesn't actually connect to the clavicle. Okay? In order to stabilize the AC joint between the acromion and the clavicle, you have to attach to both the scapula and the clavicle. Notice that these two, they don't attach to the acromion, but they do attach from the scapula to the clavicle. This one right here attaches from the scapula to the clavicle. The coracoacromial ligament doesn't attach to the clavicle. In fact, it's sort of an interscapular ligament because it connects two adjacent parts of the scapula, the acromion and the coracoid process. So coracoacromial ligament is there, and it has some functions, which we'll talk about, but it does not itself stabilize the AC joint. Only these three right here do. Now, in terms of blood and nerve supply, Blood supply to the AC joint is via the suprascapular and the thoracoacromial arteries. Okay? Um, it's also worth noting that the suprascapular artery actually is going to go over this ligament right here. There's a nerve called the suprascapular nerve that goes through the suprascapular foramen, but the suprascapular artery doesn't go with it. It goes over the superior lateral scapular ligament on its way to supply uh, the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus. Okay? So hopefully that makes sense. And then the nerve supply is via the lateral pectoral nerve and the axillary nerve. All right, let's go look at another picture here to get an even better understanding. Here they've removed the humerus and really the entire shoulder joint capsule to expose the glenoid fossa or the glenoid cavity. So again, here's an anterior view of the scapula. I can tell it's anterior because there's no spine. So this is the uh, sub subscapular fossa. Here's the coracoid process, and here's the acromion. Coracoid process is more anterior, so this is closest to us in the picture, so this, again, is an anterior view. Over here's the sternal end of the clavicle. Here's the acromial end of the clavicle in its articulation with the acromion. And so this would actually be the acromioclavicular ligament. These two right here both comprise the coracoclavicular ligament because they attach the coracoid process to the clavicle. Notice that the more medial one 
is the conoid ligament and the more lateral one is the trapezoid. So if you're looking at a picture and you can't really tell which one's more conoid or curved in shape, you can actually just look at their relative orientation. The conoid part is more medial and the trapezoid part is more lateral. Okay? So those two comprise the coracoclavicular ligament. And if we did have the coracoacromial ligament, it would span from the coracoid process right here to the acromion, but it does not itself stabilize the AC joint. And then, of course, here's the conoid tubercle, which is part of the attachment of the conoid ligament of the coracoclavicular ligament. Here's the suprascapular notch. Okay? Again, there would be a ligament right here called the superior lateral scapular ligament that would create a suprascapular foramen out of that notch. And it would provide a passageway for the suprascapular nerve. Okay? So another look at that right there. Now, let's actually even dissect this further. Okay. Again, this is an anterior view right here. Here's the clavicle. Here's the acromion of the scapula. And what they've done is they've cut open uh, this joint capsule. And really, they've cut open the acromioclavicular ligament. And what we can see inside here is there's another intraarticular disc, very similar to what we saw in the sternoclavicular joint, a fibrocartilage articular disc. We have another fibrocartilage articular disc here between the acromial end of the clavicle and the acromion of the scapula. However, this disc does not create it into a ball and socket joint. Okay? It's there mostly for cushioning and for protection. Uh, since the shoulder is going to be very mobile, you need to have a lot of protection there. Okay? Here's some of the ligaments here um, that are attaching on the coracoid process. This one, which does not stabilize the AC joint directly, is the coracoacromial ligament from the coracoid process to the acromion. Over here, we have the two parts of the coracoclavicular ligament. This one that's more laterally places the trapezoid ligament. And then this one is the conoid ligament, which you can tell in this picture that it's curved. Here's the neck of the scapula right here, and the neck would actually have the glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa right here. But of course, now we have a part of the joint capsule of the glenohumeral joint. The head of the humerus is very large. It would be basically right here. Here's the head of the humerus. And then here's the humerus right here. This would be the greater tubercle of the humerus. And the lesser tubercle would be right here. Notice that we have that transverse humeral ligament that spans from the greater tubercle to the lesser tubercle, and then it also creates an intertubercular groove. Now we can't actually see the groove right here, but notice we have that biceps tendon. This is the tendon of the long head of the biceps. It actually is going to move up and underneath the transverse humeral ligament, and eventually it's going to curve around and insert on the superior part of the glenoid cavity, also called the superglenoid tubercle. Right? We'll look at that again in more detail in a later video. Also notice here that at the very base of the shoulder joint, we have something called an axillary pouch. It turns out that at the glenohumeral joint, there's actually some slack right here. Because the shoulder joint is so mobile, you actually have to have some slack because if you actually abduct, especially your shoulder joint, you don't want this to be tight from the get-go. Otherwise, it'll restrict the range of motion. And also, it'll compress some of the vessels and other structures like nerves that are going to be in the axilla. So you have to have some slack here. It's really loose, and that's called the axillary pouch. Okay, We'll cover that when we look at the shoulder joint. What you should also notice here is there's something called a subacromial space. Again, we'll look at that when we look at the shoulder joint, but it suffices to say now that the subacromial space is really a space created by a subacromial arch. Subacromial arch is created by the acromion, the coracoid process, and this ligament, which is the coracoacromial ligament. If this ligament wasn't here, there'd be a gap between the acromion and the coracoid process. So this ligament, it doesn't stabilize the AC joint, but it does complete the subacromial arch. And the subacromial arch is important because it actually restricts the upward translation of the humerus. Um, so the humerus can only go up a certain amount. Okay? If it were to go up any further, it would easily dislocate. And it can still dislocate, obviously. But this arch, or subacromial arch, is going to play an important role in restricting that upward translation of the humerus to help prevent uh, subluxation and dislocation. And also, the space under here, the subacromial space, is created by the subacromial arch right here. Okay. All right, so hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the structures of the AC joint and also the major ligaments that are stabilizing it. 
In the next video, we're going to do a brief review of everything that we've seen up to this point, and then we're going to go into what's called the scapulothoracic joint. After that, we'll look more at the shoulder joint and then the elbow joint. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.